Hello, my fellow Ripplers. This is Chris Miles, your cash flow expert and anti financial advisor. Well, I'm going to show this for you, those that work so hard for your money and you're not ready for your money. So, working harder for you right now. You want that freedom of cash flow today, not 30 or 40 bazillion years from now, right now. So, you can live that life that you love with those you love. But, guys, it's not just about getting rich, it's about living a rich life because as you're blessed financially, you have greater capacity to create a ripple effect through the lives of others. And that's exactly what the Money Ripple Show is all about here. So thanks for tuning in. And again, thanks for those you've been reaching out. You've been binging on these podcasts. You've been sharing them, but you've also been asking questions. And so feel free to ask questions of us, whether it's about infinite banking or it's about you know how to create more passive income now. Feel free to reach out to us at moneyripples.com. Chris Miles was able to retire twice by the time he was 39 years old, but he's not content to just enjoy his own financial freedom and peace of mind. Chris wants you to have your own ripple effect so you can live free today. He's not the financial advisor you expected. He's the anti-financial advisor you deserve. He's jumping behind the mic right now, ready to make waves. Here's Chris Miles. All right, today, guys, I brought back a repeat guest, uh, Whitney Elkins Hutton. Now, if you've been listening to the show long enough, you know who she is. If you've just started listening or you haven't gone back at least, I don't know, 40 or 50 episodes, um, you know, it probably got buried back there. Um, in fact, I think this is, is this the second or third time I've had you on? I want to say it's third. Third, yes. Third time's a charm. Yeah, yeah so you're, repeat. You're I, like I, the Hall of Fame of guests <laughs> when it comes to that. <laughs> well, That's awesome. awesome. It's so, such a- Pleasure. Thank you, Chris. Oh, absolutely. And so those of you that don't know Whitney, so Whitney actually, you know, I met her first because she became a client, uh, but then she's gone out and done her own thing. She's been mentoring people, helping people with, out with this, this kind of stuff in the alternative investment space. And even now has access to some investment deals that are pretty enticing. And we'll, ha- we'll talk about that a little bit today too. So again, welcome back, Whitney. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm so happy to be paying it forward. So give us just a brief Reader's Digest version of of your background and what got you to where you are today? Yeah, definitely. Um, I started off real estate investing in 2002, completely by accident and did a live and flip and a house hack. Um, But I I mean, it was an accidental landlord. I bought a house with a significant other, relationship fell apart and I didn't know what to do. Stuffed the property full of roommates, uh, completed the rehab myself. YouTube didn't exist. So it was, I, I was, Flipping through the Home Depot 123 book, trying to teach myself drywall, which, by the way, guys, don't suggest that. <laughs> um, but anyways, long story short, I you know, made um, $52,000 profit and then realized I hadn't been paying um, for any of my expenses for months. And I was like, oh, how many more of these kind of live and flip house, house, house hack projects can I do? And I did a few more by myself and then you know, married my husband. We did a few together. And, um, I think where you and I encountered, you know, uh, started working together is when I transitioned into single family buying, like I was, you know, buying, actually holding onto the rentals to create that passive income stream. And then I got tapped out of money and I'm like, ah, I leverage everything around me in order to be able to scale faster and further. And so, um, that's when we started getting learning how to leverage cash flow life insurance, learn how to tap into our retirement accounts you know, learning how to uh, negotiate partnerships and stuff like that. And um, I also got introduced into the passive investing space, both actively and passively. And so I started off um, investing passively, just kind of, I was like, why not get paid to learn, right? Um, Get paid for my education. And then I stumbled into, kind of stumbled into a partnership with Um, a private equity group and was able to provide value to them, scaled with them, which actually led to where I am today with PassiveInvesting.com. I'm the director of investor education here. And I just get get to geek out and talk real estate all day long. It's amazing. (laughs) That's, that's, that's going a long ways from drywall one, two, three, home Depot to all of a sudden PassiveInvesting.com. And you're, you're a, you know, director of education there now, huh? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, you know, personally, um, just to kind of draw the difference, um, it's, you know, we have over 6,300 residential units um, in our personal portfolio, 1,400 self-storage, um, nine car washes, you know, partridge and a pear tree, right? Um, but the long story short, we had to start somewhere. And that, you know, that somewhere was that first property. And um, it's kind of, I always try to, you know, create the analogy for people. You look at an iceberg, like, 
you know, and, and you see people's success, it's 10% above water, you know, the, the rest of the 90% is below water. And that's the journey that most people don't see. Um, yeah. And that's why I love podcasts. I love reading books because that's where you actually get to learn the backstory. It's most people are a 10 year overnight success, right? So. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and I want to kind of go into that because we we're talking about this before we went on the air and there's a lot of people that uh, even listen to this podcast right now and you know who you are if uh, if I say this, but because uh, and if you say, oh, Chris, you pointed me out individually. No, you're not alone. There's lots of people that say these phrases, but they'll say things like, okay, that sounds great. But, you know, when you guys talk about a 10% per year baseline, that sounds too good to be true. Or, you know, the fact that you guys can get people out of the rat race or I've seen people talk about passive income and then they tell me I have to start this whole brand new business about becoming an active investor, which is not really passive at all. You know, mm -hmm. so there's all this skepticism about this. And of course, people are talking about financial freedom, but most of the time it's it's about slaving away, right? And it's slaving away, like you're saying, you know, now you weren't saying slaving away, but 10 years become an overnight success, right? Um, but people are like, wait, come on, this is too good to be true. Can you really create double digit returns and it's passive where you could still work your job, do your business, do what you love, and this can still work? What, what, how would you respond to people like that that are kind of new to the space anyways? I would say absolutely. Yes, you can. I'm living proof. Um, but, you know, to draw more tangible steps, right? Like, I think that's where people, when they say, when they ask the question, come on, can you really do this? They're, they're actually asking, how does this work for me? And, and so, um, you know, I think there's a lot of training. You talk about this, Chris, you know, especially when we were in our coaching relationships, you know, we are trained by the media by our fiduciaries, like in our 401ks to accept a certain level of return and give up our control and responsibility. And, you know, it's really when we step into our own and take, um, you know, understand what our true investing goals are, our true risk tolerance, and then actually take on that investing ourselves. I mean, that's scary. But if you're willing to accept that control, guess what? Now you're in the strategist and the operator seat. Who gets paid? the strategist and the operator, right? You're switching yeah. hats. You're no longer, you know, the, the person that's just handing over pay, uh, your paycheck and crossing your fingers and hoping that it works out 30 years from now or 40 years from now. Um, so you have to accept a certain level of responsibility. And in exchange for that, you should accept, you know, get re a return. Now, when we talk tangibly about the investment, there's so many different things that we can do. Um, you know, for us, you know, at, you know, at passiveinvesting.com, we love multifamily hotels, car washes, self storage, um, very rest recession resilient asset classes. We can kind of dive down at, you know, some rabbit holes there, but we're looking to create passive income for our investors as well as equity growth. Okay. We're in partnership with them. Okay. We're not putting them in a debt position. Um, you know, we're, we're sharing the risk and the rewards together on all these assets. Uh, but yeah, like I can tell you from my personal portfolio, I average about seven and a half to 8% preferred return monthly. That's coming in monthly checks on everything I have invested and that's the preferred return. That's just like the, kind of like your base salary, right? So that's, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And there, and the preferred return is actually different than the cash on cash return. Um, and you know, we can, I would love to kind of pick that apart for people. Um, if you'll allow me to kind of yeah. take a tangent is because a lot of people they'll read, um, you know, especially if they're coming in the space, they're like, I'm looking for an 8% preferred return or a 10% preferred return, right? They're looking for that paycheck. Um, that's different than what the cash on cash could be 10% a 10% preferred return. I really wish we would just drop the lingo return. It's yeah. a hurdle. So it means the first seven, 8% of the deal goes, the profits on the deal go to the investor before the general partnership begins to share in the deal. And so yeah. uh, I really encourage people to look on the cash on cash numbers. Now, where we are in today's market across the board on a lot of investments, we're probably seeing year one cash on cash between five and 6%, maybe up to eight, nine and 10. It depends on how much risk you're willing to take. And then you should see it ramp up from then. Uh, so that's one way I get paid. What's coming in monthly is a distribution. Okay. Or quarterly. I like monthly because my bills are monthly. It's easier for me to keep track of. And then when the asset repositions, maybe refinances or sells at the end of the business plan, I get a gain. 
And so um, I think the easiest number to look at here is the equity multiple because it allows me to kind of compare and contrast based on time. Uh, well, it doesn't actually, that number doesn't take into account time, but it allows me to kind of easily do math in my head. Like if I'm investing a hundred thousand dollars and business plans five years, and it says a two X equity multiple, I, you know, potentially I'm going to walk away between distributions and capital gains with $200,000. That's real. I had six uh, assets exit at the end of the last year and they all hit two X equity multiple or above. Um, I've had another seven exit this year um, and they're all hitting at about like 1.9 to 2.4. Now, why would it tick down a little bit? Well, the, you know, it, it's based on time. You know, if we're only holding it for like, you know, three years, it's not going to be quite that equity multiple, but now we're getting into like higher level math. Yeah. But either way, that's still way into double digit returns. If you think of that, like doubling your money yes. in five years. Not yeah. Very so of course. Yeah. You know, if we're talking about the internal rate of return, you know, we're probably hitting, you know, um, I know average on our deals is 25% on our exits. Mm. Yeah. So you can't get that in the stock market. No, <laughs> not no, safely. definitely not. not in a you conservative can go to financial way. advisor say, I'll give you that. <laughs> right. I, and nobody should say, I can give you that. No. No, because nobody, you know, it's, uh, it's, yeah, you want them to be conservative. Yeah. And we want to put a disclaimer here. Results may vary. And also we're not giving any investment recommendations right now uh, with what we're talking about here today, but, but it's true. Like it's, it sounds amazing. And many people, like you said, I, I thought you said it so beautifully because you, you were like, listen, we've been trained to accept a certain rate of return to give up all of our control, to let somebody else handle it. And, and we're just almost turn a blind eye to it and just hope that things work out. And there is a, a different level of accountability when you're the one behind the, behind the wheel, right? But you don't have to be the one driving the investment. You don't have to be the one finding the deals and doing all that kind of stuff. There are deals already ready made, but um, as I want to go into as well, the next thing, and I know we we're talking about this before we went on the air, it's not just about the investment, is it? Mm -mm. No. And that's another thing. Um, I think, you know, we've been trained to look at numbers. Like what is the yeah. yield? What is my return? And um, that's really because you have, if you're investing in securities um, and I should say like stocks, bonds, mutual funds, uh, you can't control anything else. You can't control the operator in the mutual fund. You can't control the market where you're going to invest in. You can't even control what businesses are going to be included in the mutual fund. So the only thing that you can look at your decision point is, am I going to make money potentially or lose money or like, you know, that's it, you know? Now, when you start investing in private equities, um, now you have a whole other level of control and responsibility, right? We've already touched on, you know, you have to know your investing goals. You have to know your, you know, your to risk tolerance. Um, I, I love the book Cash Flow Quadrant by Robert Kiyosaki because I think it explains this very well because now you're having, if you want to be completely passive and in, as an investor, you have to go in the I quadrant. So you have to find good businesses to invest with. And so when you're investing in private equities, you should switch your mindset. It's not all about the numbers, right? That is one factor. It's a factor. But who is the person that's going to help you hit that number? Okay, because a great operator can take a pretty mediocre deal and just crush it out of the park. Um, a not so great operator could take an amazing deal and possibly tank it. So the operations team is who is going to get that deal across the finish line. So knowing how to underwrite the operator, you know how to knowing how to find great operators, and I love what you do here at uh, Money Ripples. Um, also, what markets are those operators in? You know, are they in good, strong cash flowing um, primary markets? Are they more in tertiary markets? There's a risk profile for each type of market, right. and then you get down to evaluating the deal. But all along the way, you have, you're going to be checking, you know, the different, you know, parameters of the operator of the market and the deal against what you've already established as your investing goals. Definitely. Yeah. As we were talking about before, and uh, I even heard somebody say on another interview, right? It's not about the horse. It's about betting on the jockey. You know, the horse helps. You got to have a decent horse that can at least make it to the finish line. But the jockey, you know, the operator, the person that's actually doing the deal is the one that can knock it out of the park for you. Yeah, they're going to so, know like how to how hard to run that horse. They're going to know like how to, 
you know, um, you know, adjust like the tactics, like with the horse, I had, I knew nothing about like horse racing, but, um, Mm -hmm. I do know, you know, the, the jockey would know what to do with the business plan. Like what is their business experience? What is their real estate experience? Um, what is their, you know, experience with a particular strategy that they're executing, um, with their exit plan even. So you want somebody that has like, you know, that deep breadth of knowledge. What's their worst failure? You know, that's always a fun one too. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, it just track record and performance. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I have, um, I do a Tuesday masterclass where I go, you know, deep dive into passive investing in different parts. Uh, you know, just kind of the things that everybody needs to know. You guys can find me there and I'm sure we'll, we'll touch on, you know, how to register for that. But, uh, I help people understand all these different moving pieces and how to vet operators markets and wheels. Yeah. That's a, that's one question that I know it's big. Cause for me, it's not just like, Hey, have you lost on deals? For me, it's more, did you lose? And what did you learn? Right? Like what kind of experience did you gain from that? You know, and, and how's that made you a better investor today or better operator of that deal? Or not even lost. Like what challenges have you faced and what did you do to overcome them? Yeah. Right? Um, the right now, a, a lot of operators are selling assets that have been very challenging for them, like in 2019, 20, and 21. But because the, all the, you know, the, the tide's been going up and assets have been appreciating across the board, you, you ask an operator, have you lost? They can go, no, because they didn't. They probably still hit their IRR. They probably still blew their equity multiple out of the water. But were they paying distributions for 12 months during COVID? You know, those are the type right. of questions you want to kind of like dig under the surface and really start getting granular with the operator um, to, to uncover like what challenges they have. And that's not a scary question. And, and no operator mm-hmm. should feel intimidated by that question. I mean, we all, every, everybody, every operator has like some sort of learning experience that they've, they've taken away. And you want to, you want to see it like, as if you were hiring for your own business, you know, you want to see like how they've overcome that. In fact, if they, if they shy away from the question, it probably means you should not ever do a deal with those people. It means <laughs> that they're you. probably hiding yes. more. <laughs> they probably lack the experience. Yes. Well, I know we only have a few minutes here, but tell us about the operators you work with. I mean, cause you've, you've invested with lots of different areas and places and you've gained the experience over the last 20 years yourself. You know, why, why do you work with the people you work with and what's been their track record? Yeah. So I work with, you know, many different operators. Um, you know, I, I should say personally invest uh, operators and multifamily um, self-storage ATMs. Uh, you know, I'm looking for a deep bench of experience in real estate. You know, if, if that's what, you know, the investment is, I'm looking for um, business experience, you know, especially if it's a larger operator that has multiple properties, especially in the same like geographic area. Um, what is their scaling? Like, you know, because it's one thing to pick up like one, two, three, four buildings, but whenever you start getting five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, you now need to add that operator needs. They, it's not it's no longer just two or three people running the business. They need to have a team built out underneath them so they can delegate to, and that's keeping an eye on the ball and making sure all the assets are being managed appropriately. Um, so how are they scaling their business? Um, you know, what's their ability to source deals? You know, do they have a great pipeline built, built out? Um, there's a lot of, you know, relationships that I look for, you know, when I'm talking to operators, how can they get off market deals? How can they work with developers and get the deal at a a bigger discount before it ever hits the market? So I can hedge, kind of hedge my bets as an investor. These are things that we do at passiveinvesting.com. Um, how, what kind of, uh, acquisitions team do they have? What is their methodology for underwriting? Um, is their underwriting conservative, right? I was seeing numbers last year that were scaring me, scaring the pants off of me. I remember, um, a few deals that, you know, we passed on and you, lo and behold, you see another operator put it out and they paid 8 million over <laughs> what the last offer was. And you're just like, Oh, um, how did, you know, it makes you wonder what they were doing to manipulate the numbers. Um, yeah. so I want to understand the full underwriting, how they're underwriting their deals. If I can get the actual underwriting, fantastic. Not everybody shares their underwriting, which I totally understand. Sometimes they have to sign a a non-disclosure agreement and they can't share it. And then, you know, what type of lending is going on the property? I want to understand the different types of lending. You've got fixed rate debt 
we've got floating rate debt. I want to see debt at least for the term of the, the business hold. And I want to see the interest rate either fixed or with a cap. And if it has a cap on that floating rate debt, I want to make sure that the, it's been underwritten at the full cap for the entire hold. Right. Because I know of one operator right now, we're not going to call him out, um, that did a fixed rate debt on the, one of their, probably like a property earlier this spring, didn't cap it. They're in trouble. Yeah. So um, that's yeah, a challenge. Stress test it. Yes. Well, they stress tested it, but I don't think they stress tested it with based on the interest 9%, rate. Nine percent plus inflation and like the yep. Fed like bumping everything up point three quarters of a point like for two mm -hmm. or three months in a row. That that was not in the stress test. So right. um, anyway, so but those are just different ways that I kind of like asking questions and picking apart, you know, just how conservative are they being? Um, how are they safeguarding the investment? Um, that way I can sleep better at night because I, when I hand over my money and I'm no longer the operator of that investment, I, I'm doing it so I can get my time back and my attention back. And also so I can sleep better at night because somebody else mm -hmm. who is more knowledgeable, more knowledgeable than me is running the investment. Right. Well, and, and with, with offers that you guys have going, you guys have, of course, different investments going on. So depending on when you guys are listening to this, this audio, there could be a completely different investment deal. But I know right now you have a hotel deal that's just about full. Um, you've got like car washes that come up occasionally. So you got some of these things that are more on the speculative end, uh, even you know self-storage, you know, things like that. How do you guys minimize the risk in your deals? Yeah, so we can take it, you know, um, we have a little... If you know, people are listening to it now, you know, right as of today, we do have some space left in our hotel deal. So yeah, so when you talk about hotels, you know, we're very specific in what type of hotels that we're, we're going after. I mean, generally hotels, you know, were challenged during COVID-19 and right now there's a window to pick them up because they're undervalued based on their net operating income, their tra trailing 12 and 24 expenses. However, you can't lump all hotels in one basket. Um, the hotels that got hit the hardest are actually the, um, you know, full service hotels, the conference venues, the wedding venues. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you also have limited services hotels, which we're going to stick a pin in that because that's what the space we're in. You have the budget hotels and then you also have kind of like your motels, your micro motels. Yeah. So, you know, we love the limited services space. We love having branding on the hotels, but we will entertain independent brands as well. But it's, we're very specifically looking for a hotel that stood on its own merits for leisure and residential travel during COVID. So they actually didn't get kept in the teeth, others, aside from the first two or three weeks. And so they have strong net operating income on, on the asset. The problem is, is that they're kind of stigmatized right now. Also, we're looking for, you know, overlay on top of that, a very strong corporate strategy to come back. Now we're not underwriting the purchase of these hotels with that car. We're not giving the hotel, the seller that income for the corporate strategy. We're looking to harvest that for when it comes back. And we are seeing that come back. Case in point, we have a deal right now in Hilton Head you know, it's a destination island. There's 2.9 million visitors that go there every single year. It's the only holiday inn on the island. Um, and then you, you have over 35 million people that live in a 300 mile radius. That's a huge draw. And then when you look at the income of the people that come to the island, you know, um, there's a plenty of room to move the average daily rate of the hotel. And when we're talking about hedging inflation, that's huge because, you know, when you're looking at multifamily and I still love multifamily, but I, I can't adjust rates, but once a year. Yeah. Okay? Self-storage, 30 days, car washes, maybe every two weeks to 30 days. You don't really want to confuse your customers a whole lot by moving, mm -hmm. moving your, your subscription prices around, but hotels, I can move that on a nightly basis. Heck, I can move it midday if all my book, you know, if half my hotel books up like first thing in the morning, I can change pricing that afternoon. And yeah. so um, it is a very flexible strategy. But yeah, you have to know what kind of hotel to look for, what kind of market to be in. We're looking for strong markets where the populations are growing and especially strong blue chip companies coming in. Again, to kind of hedge our bets. So we've got the leisure coming in. We've got the you know, just the, the, the tourism part of it coming in. And then we also have the corporate like strategy, like for corporate travel coming in. Perfect. Well, Whitney, this is, this has been really insightful. This has been really cool to see. So uh, we'll be sure to like, also put the, the links and everything and contact information in the, in the show notes, as well as on the blog page so that people can see this 
they can uh, you know reach out to you and and really understand more about these deals. It's pretty Absolutely. pretty pretty interesting. Thank you. Yeah, happy to share. Absolutely. Well, everybody, there you have it. I mean, it, you might be skeptical, wondering if this stuff is too good to be true. And hey, even if it was, it's worth looking into. <laughs> you know, it's worth really di diving deeper to see because what if it's not? What if this is actually everything we're telling you is one hundred percent true and legit? it is, what is that costing you right now by not learning more about it, not taking action? So that's my challenge to you guys is that, Hey, you can listen to these podcasts all you want, but what are you going to do with this information? How will this change your life and potentially create some freedom that you never knew were, was possible for you? That's the challenge I have for you guys. If you have any questions, of course, go to moneyripples.com. You can also check out the blog there with the contact for Whitney and her company. Go and make a wonderful, prosperous week. We'll see you later. 